if you don't mind, let me, if you don't have a theology for what we're talking about, um, you're not going to be able to sustain the, the battle. If you're coming in all hyped up and emotional, that's wonderful. We, you need emotion, you need passion, but more than that, because things are going to ebb and flow. You're going to win some, you're going to lose some. And if this is all based upon emotion, uh, you'll just get discouraged and quit. And I've seen that over time. So I want to talk to you about a mindset, the mindset that Troy has, that Pastor has, Pastor Roll, uh, about how to engage long-term in what we're trying to do. And uh, the Lord uh, reminded me, uh, right now, the man who is the, uh, the uh, president of the state uh, Senate, Brian Jones, uh, I helped Brian Jones run his first campaign when he was running for city council in Santee. Now he's the most influential and highest ranking Republican in the whole state. Uh, but because he persevered, you can't just dip your toe in, in and out, in and out. If we're going to, how many of you know, the other side, they're committed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we just got to want it more than they do. Do you? Yeah. Yes. Let me just share with you what I shared with my church last Sunday. About, well, what can I bring to you? Well, this is what I shared with my church. Maybe it'll encourage you. There's a, there's a, a real crisis of leadership in the church these days. Yeah. I, uh, there's a particular guy who's a, who's a consultant, and he puts on these national seminars, and he sends out emails, and I'm on the list. And this was his uh, advice last week, and it just floored me. If you want to be a successful pastor, here's... The five things you need to do in order to be a successful pastor. And people pay big money to go to these conferences to hear this. The, the bottom line is you just need to muzzle yourself. <laughs> and because that's what you need to do, because after all, you know, you're not an expert on anything except some very narrowly defined categories of spirituality. And you're not an expert on, on politics and economics and all of that stuff. So just stick to your knitting, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Just focus on spiritual things very, very narrowly defined. And let's leave everything in the hands of the experts. Wow. Did they fire him? Well, in, in light of COVID, how did our experts do recently? Right? <laughs> what, did, what did we learn? The Bible says in Colossians 2, verse 3, and this has almost become my life verse as I meditate on it. It's very simple, and you've read it a thousand times. In Christ are hidden all. We've learned about what does all mean? All. all. Okay. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So if Christ's shepherds are not speaking in his behalf and bringing all all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge for all things, and then there's a vacuum, someone's going to fill the vacuum. And what have we seen over the last hundred years? It's a bunch of Marxists and commies. And frankly, if you drill down long enough, they're a bunch of perverts. Every one of them are sexually deviant. Honest, I, I, read the history. So either we're going to shepherd... <laughs> or we're going to create a vacuum and someone else is going to come in and shepherd. So what do we know? Let me just encourage you. God has revealed what he's up to. This isn't a secret. All things were created through Christ in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible thrones or dominions, rulers and authorities. All things were created by Christ and for him. Amen. Do we believe that? Yes. And by making peace through his blood on the cross, God is reconciling all things unto himself. Amen. And so we have a very simple and yet very comprehensive apostolic message. It's recorded for us in Acts 10, verse 36. You can know it. Speaking of Jesus Christ, it just says simply, he is Lord of, what's our word? Oh. All. By the way, had the, the rulers of the world at that time known what God was up to, the New Testament tells us, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Why? Because it was their death sentence. Had they known what was going to happen, 
Because now God has exalted our Christ to the right hand. And he has given him a name, which is above every name. And as a reward for his perfect obedience, he lived the life we should have lived and died the death we deserve to die. For that perfect obedience, God has granted him all the nations. Psalm 2, the father says to the son, ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. Amen. Amen. And if nations belong to him, California belongs to him. When Jesus Christ hung on the cross, we're, we're told he triumphed over all the powers and principalities by his cross. And we have been told in the book of Revelation that the power of the devil to deceive the nations was broken. Remember, up until that time, every nation in the world was under demonic delusions. And it was by the cross that the power of Satan's uh, authority over the nations was broken. And now God has deployed us. He's put us on mission to crash the gates of hell and to destroy Satan's strongholds. And how do we do it? It's very simple. We have two weapons. We have prayer and we have proclamation. But they are mighty through God, and, and through those weapons over the centuries, God's people have plundered and subdued the devil's kingdoms. The job description is not changed. So now we are called to disciple nations, teaching them to observe all things that Christ has commanded. We are com to command all men everywhere to believe the gospel and to submit to Christ. First in our own lives personally, then our families, then our church. But we're also to speak to the larger culture, including politicians and economists, educators and doctors, engineers. And it even goes to sports and entertainment, including halftime shows and Grammy Awards. That's right. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Okay. So in Acts we read, and I encourage you, if you haven't read it, the uh, maybe Acts 17 and following, what God did in this tiny little church in Ephesus. In the, and out of that church, God established what would we know now, looking back, they didn't know what would, God was doing. It became literally the beachhead for the future of Christendom in the West. It said that they were able, out of that church, to reach all of Asia, and, and they speculate that could have been as few as 3 million. It could have been as many as 18 million people out of this one little church in Ephesus because they were fiercely committed to this message. Jesus, not Caesar, is Lord. That's right. Amen. And that's where we're at in the culture today. Yes. In California, we declare Jesus, not Gavin, is Lord. Jesus, not Biden, is Lord. But in doing so, you got to read the stories. They risked everything. They endured insults. They endured beatings, imprisonment, false imprisonments. And, and we know the story of the martyrs. 11 of the 12 apostles gave their life for this very simple message. Jesus, not Caesar, is Lord. But as a result, millions and millions of people were delivered from the demonic false gods and idols of paganism. So I'm speaking to pastors, but this is for all of us. We need to be like our good shepherd. He laid down his life for the sheep. So every pastor is called to lay down his life for his church in particular, but for the church in general. See, Americans, pastors and believers have the same calling that the pastors in Ephesus had. There's not two gospels, one for comfortable middle-class American Christians <laughs> and then one for the, the people who are suffering for the sake of Christ in communist countries or Muslim countries. There's one gospel, there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, and we're all called to be in 100%, just like everyone else has been called. So every faithful church has to be thinking and acting like that church in Ephesus 
we have to take turf. They were fiercely committed to taking territory for Jesus. Are you? Elders, to be elders, have to model courage. Godly courage. Physical courage. They got to be able to go out and put it on the line just like the apostles did. Of course, godly character and hard work. But the good news is Jesus never calls us to do for him what he didn't first do for us. <coughs> That's why we love him, right? We love him because he first loved us. He's never called us to risk more for him than he risked for us. That's why in Jeremiah, one of the great promises of God is, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Is your <laughs> pastor feeding you with true knowledge and understanding? Is he declaring the comprehensive lordship of Jesus? And is he modeling biblical courage? What is he risking? What does he put on the line for Jesus? I won't countenance people in my church, in my pulpit, that haven't, I want to see the scars of your ministry. <laughs> what, have, what have you uh, spent? What does it cost you to serve Jesus? Amen. The good news is I'm going to have Troy preach at our church tomorrow. And uh, I want that spirit. Is Jesus really the Lord? Is he? Did he really claim us? And yes, he did. And I know <laughs> when we hear this, our hearts combust, right? We, we know this is right. And so what we're trying to do is to glorify God in all of this activity, declaring his lordship in every sphere and risking everything for him. That's what we're calling you to today. Let me close with a quote from somebody who did this, a, guy, a gentleman, and if you have not read of him, you, you may want to. His name was Abraham Kuyper. In 1900, Abraham Kuyper was the prime minister of the Netherlands. He was a pastor. He was a publisher. He started the Amsterdam uh, Free University. And he wrote this uh, little quote. And he's the one, by the way, who said that there's not one thumb's breadth. It's kind of an interesting turn of phrase. We would say not hold up your thumb. It's about one square inch, right? There's not one thumb's breadth in the entire universe over which Jesus does not, de there's not one over which Jesus does not declare mine. It's all his. This is all his. Listen to what he says here. When principles that run against your deepest convictions begin to win the day, then battle is your calling and peace is has become sin. You must, at the price of dearest peace, lay your convictions bare before friend and enemy with all the fire of your faith. Amen. May God give us the grace to do that. And thank you, Pastor Roll, for leading us and let us live lives and dream dreams worthy of our Christ. Amen. Amen.